Hi! In this video, we're going to discuss about the basic concepts of special proceedings found in Rule 72 to 82 of the Rules of Court. Disclaimer, this video is only for educational purposes and it's not a substitute for professional legal advice. If you have legal concerns or issues, please contact a lawyer. I welcome corrections. If you have one or if you see one in this video, simply comment down below or contact me. So what is a special proceeding? A special proceeding is a remedy or an application for the establishment of SRP or status, right, or particular fact. This is laid down in Rule 1, Section 3C of the Rules of Court. Or it is any other remedy furnished by law other than an ordinary suit. In contrast, what is a civil action? A civil action is one by which a party sues another for the enforcement of or protection of a right or the prevention or address of a wrong. So the main keywords here are uh, suing, rights, and wrong. So a civil action exists because there is a right and there is a wrong committed or being prevented. And as a result, one party sues another. So what are the distinguishing features of ordinary actions or civil actions versus special proceedings. So as to nature, ordinary actions are adversarial, meaning there's one party suing another, as while special proceedings uh, are non-adversarial. However, this can be transformed into uh, an adversarial proceeding when there are oppositors, or sorry, sorry for the typo. And then for the filing, ordinary actions must be filed in a formal demand or through a uh, observation or uh, execution of a formal demand against another while a special proceeding is a petition or application or could be a pleading. As to parties, ordinary actions must have at least two because again the definition is one party sues another. But in one case, uh, there is a, there is a case where the uh, parties were named as uh, uh, plaintiff and defendants, but it was actually uh, a special proceeding because uh, the nature of such proceeding or such case is just the establishment of a particular fact or particular status. While in special proceedings, again, there's only one party. Next, for the basis, uh, it must be cause of action for ordinary actions, meaning, again, there must be a right entitled to the plaintiff and uh, the defendant allegedly violated such right. For special proceedings, it doesn't have to have a, a cause of action. There, there's no need for a right to be violated. For pleadings, formal pleadings are required for ordinary actions while um, it's not required with special proceedings. Again, it can be a, an application. For the courts, it will be courts of general jurisdiction that will have uh, jurisdiction over ordinary actions, while in special proceedings, the courts are limited and special, or they have limited and special jurisdiction, such as the probate court or the interstate court. So we, often, we will often hear the word executor in uh, special proceedings, and what are these, or who are these? Executors are people or persons that are named in the decedent's last will and testament uh, who, uh, whom the testator wanted to manage his estate, especially when he or she is gone. So the main goal of an executor is to execute or to fulfill. From the word, from the word execute itself, meaning uh, just like the executive, <clears throat> the, the main role is merely to, f to fulfill the wishes of the law or the will. So the will, it's like the legislative and the executive um, department of the government. So the executive merely uh, uh, fulfills the law that was or that were um, created by the legislature. So in the same way, that's also the executor. He merely fulfills the wishes of the testator. So the requirements are very simple. First, this must be competent. Of course, this goes with legal competence, legal competence, and then he must accept the trust because no one is, uh, no one should be forced to be to be an executor. It must be uh, in his uh, free 
uh, decision to, to follow the wishes. And then number three, he must give a bond as required by the rules. Uh, just in summary, the, the bond serves as an assurance that such executor will will uh, not uh, put the estate into waste. Okay, next. How about an administrator? An administrator is the opposite of uh, in the, the case of executor. There's a will. Administrator, when there's no will. Okay, so it's not appointed by the, by the uh, testator, but it is appointed by the court or by you know, by the law itself, so through the court. So the court will appoint the administrator when there is no executor named in the will or if there is an executor but he is not able or he's not willing to serve. And the again, still the same purpose, still the same objective. Uh, the administrator is to distribute the, the uh, estate, the properties of the, of the uh, dissident, of the person who died, According not to the wishes of the testator, because again there's no will, but according to the law of intestacy. Okay, so this is uh, only uh, this is uh, in understood when we have taken up, uh, or if you have uh, knowledge or foundations uh, in succession law. So what is issued by the court if it allows an executor to act? Okay, so going back again, so there's an ex there's a will and. Uh, the the person who wrote the will named an executor. So when the court approves the will in what we call as a probate, when the when the will is probated, what will the court issue? Okay, it is called a letters testamentary. Okay, a letters testamentary. This is an order of the court um, allowing the the person to execute the last will and testament. How about when there's no will and uh, the court will appoint someone to administer the properties? So what, what will, uh, when is an administrator granted by the court? Okay, so again, as we said, if there's no person named in the will or incompetent or unwilling, or there's an addition here, he failed to give a bond, okay? In other words, if the decedent died without a will. So what rules apply to special proceedings? So special proceedings are enumerated in Rule 72, but these enumerations or these items enumerated in Rule 72 um, are not exclusive. Okay. So the question is, what rules will govern them? Okay. Generally, the rules that will apply to special proceedings are those specifically provided for under Rule 73 to Rule 7 to Rule 109. Okay. But in the absence of rules, the what will supplement are rules of ordinary actions, which can be found in Rules 71 or in Rules 1 to 61. Okay. So uh, rules 161 provide for the rules on, on ordinary actions or when, when one party sues another. So these will govern or these will supply or supplement the rules of special proceedings if there are none, there are no rules for such. Okay? And how, how should these rules be construed? So rules are to be construed liberally in favor of a just, speedy, and inexpensive disposition of proceedings. So it's JSI. So just, speedy, and inexpensive disposition of proceedings. So this is very important because, again, the rules can be liberally construed or uh, will be interpreted li uh, liberally if the speediness, okay, or the, or the, the proceedings are now becoming very slow or in, in, uh, inefficient, okay? So the rules will be bent in a sense, okay? The rules will not be totally, absolutely followed because the consideration, again, is justice. At the end, the law is an instrument of justice. Procedures are instruments of justice. So they are there because of justice. So... Why sacrifice justice? Just because the rule said so, okay? So, 
Question, does the earnest efforts to compromise rule apply to special proceedings? So this rule is actually uh, a rule when uh, a family member sues another member. So this is when the families are involved. So the, the procedures uh, provide that no court should, shall hear a case if there is no earnest efforts to compromise uh, that have been made. Okay, so does this apply to special proceedings? So, for example, um, a family mem family members are at quarrel against each other. Let's say a cousin against another cousin, or a brother against a sister. So, if they are quarreling legally, they they have legal disputes. So, should there be earnest efforts to compromise among or between them? The answer is, in special proceedings, no. Okay, because this is non-adversarial in nature. So if the parties simply want to establish a particular fact, for example, or simply wanted to establish a particular uh, status, okay, like let's say the status that if uh, that that child is legitimate or not, okay, or a person or a sister wanted to change her name, so there's no need for earnest efforts to compromise, even if a family member is against such proceeding, because special proceedings are not adversarial. It is, it is not quarrelsome in a sense, okay? So, another question. How about certification against forum shopping, written explanation for non-service, or payment and filing of fees for money claims? So, is this required in special proceedings? On the other hand, this is required because the Supreme Court said this, is not, this will not obstruct the probate proceedings. And going back again to the main goal, this will not obstruct the just, and speedy administration and inexpensive um, disposition of justice. Okay, so these are uh, non-obstructive. Okay, or the establishment of a status, right, or particular fact. So this is ruled in Shecker. This is uh, ruled by the Supreme Court in Shecker versus Shecker. So what are the kinds of settlement of estate of a deceased person or persons presumed dead? So when a person dies, how will his properties? be settled so there are uh, two major kinds okay uh, generally speaking it should be judicially administered okay judicial settlements meaning these are settlements or distribution of properties where the court is involved okay so under this we have at least three so number one is partition we will define it later Number two is settlement through letters testamentary. And as we have discussed, letters testamentary is when a testator named someone to execute the wishes or his wishes in the will. Okay, so the court will now be involved in this by, exec by issuing letters testamentary. While the third one, this is a settlement through letters of administration if there is no uh, will, okay? If the decedent left no will or if the decedent left a will but he did not name anyone to fulfill or execute his wishes. So, for example, yes, there's a holographic will. For example, I hereby uh, dispose my uh, land to, to A and to B and to C. So, at the end of the letter, you finish reading the letter, the testator did not name anyone. So since it is a, a, a holographic will, it was made in secret. No one advised him, okay? No one advised her to, oh, you, you know, you have to name someone because when you die, you know, someone has to fulfill your wishes. So that testator is not privy to that. He's not aware that there should be an executor. He's not, he's a layman, okay? He's not an expert in law. So, uh, uh, what will now uh, the uh, what uh, what will now happen is that the court will now issue a letter of administration because uh, there's no one named as an executor, but the will of the of the testator will be annexed, okay, or, or will be incorporated or will be attached to that letter of administration, so that the the administrator will now administer the property according to the will of the. Annex. But again, that person is not uh, explicitly author or named by the uh, testator. The second kind is extrajudicial settlement. And extrajudicial means outside the judici 
judiciary or outside the court or meaning it does not involve um, uh, the, the courts uh, uh, it does not involve the court okay so what are these it's uh, EJS we call that or extrajudicial settlement of estate and or affidavit of self-adjudication so we will discuss them further later so this can be resorted to if the heirs do not re want to resort to partition or judicial administration so long as the requisites are met. So they do, if they don't want to involve the court or to, they don't want to go to the process of court, of court involvement or court uh, intervention, so they can resort to EJS uh, as long as the requirements are uh, fulfilled, which we will explain later. Okay. So the value of the estate here is immaterial, especially in the EJS and extrajudicial or affidavit of self-adjudication. On the other hand, there's another one called settlement of estate of small value. Uh, please note that this, this involves court adjudication. So meaning that it is judicially involved, it has judicial involvement, but uh, it, it's only a summary, okay? Meaning it's, it's fast, it's uh, quick, it's not full blown, okay? But the value of the estate here is material because it must not exceed 10,000 pesos. And of course, as of this year to 2023, the value of 10,000 is very small, okay, in, when it comes to a state. It doesn't, uh, this needs uh, amendment, right? Because no one, in a sense, no one would like to go through all these processes because his estate is just merely 10,000 pesos, you know. So, in a sense, this is uh, an obsolete uh, law which, which needs to be updated or increased, okay? So, what is letters of administration with a will annexed? As discussed a while ago, this is a, a document issued by a probate court when, okay, when the decedent left a valid will but no executor was named. What is the rule on administration of properties of the decedent? So, in other words, uh, what what principle? Okay, it should be judicially administered, and again, the exemptions are what what was stated a while ago, uh, except if there is an extrajudicial settlement or affidavit of self-adjudication if there's only one heir, okay? The exception is this This does not involve court intervention. So what is partition, okay? We have talked a while ago that partition is one of the ways that uh, the estate will be uh, uh, judicially uh, administered, okay? So partition is an order of the court to the defendants when it finds that the complainant has a right to have a part in a real estate or real property. So this one, there's already defendants now, okay? And then, then there's a complainant. So going back again to the definition, if there's a defendant and there's a complainant, one party sues another. So therefore, this is a an action, okay? There's, there's a, a right that allegedly has been violated. So what is the cause of action? Because the complainant uh, believes, no? he believes that he has a right to have a part in a real property okay so afterwards what what will happen is the parties will make the partition among themselves by proper instruments okay as is as approved by court and among themselves if they are able to agree and then if they agree the court will then confirm the partition as agreed by them and such agreement will be recorded in the registry of deeds where the property is situated so so when this agreement of partition and approved by the court is given to ROD, then of course the title will now be uh, given, you know, a new TCT, a new TCT or transfer certificate of title. So now the land now belongs to such parties like the defendant and the complainant, which has a legal right to such property. Okay. So what is a letter of administration as discussed also? It is a legal document requesting a court to appoint an administrator to manage the estate of a deceased person who did not leave a will. Actually, this, this, the, the question should be, what is a petition for a letter of, admi of administration? So you request, no? you request the court that you allow, that you will be allowed to manage the estate. So uh, in other words, you want the estate to be uh, properly managed. So when do the rights of, of the heirs to succession vest? Okay. So 
does it begin when you receive the letters testamentary or the letters administration if you are uh, an heir and at the same time an administrator? The answer is uh, no. Actually, it, it is vested to you at the time of the death of the decedent according to Article 777 of the New Civil Code and according to a, a latest court ruling. So, nevertheless, the rules set forth in Rule 73 to 90 must be observed. Once complied, such rights retroact to the time of death of the decedent. So, it doesn't have that, that right doesn't have to wait that the rules will be followed, but it retroacts. So, once complied, it retroacts to the time of death of the decedent. So that right is a vested right the moment when a person dies. Again, when the person dies, automatically the rights of the heirs are vested to them on that moment. Okay? So what delineates court jurisdiction in probate estate, in probate estate proceedings? What court has jurisdiction? So um, in other words, to... Who, what court has the power to hear and decide an estate proceeding or a testate proceeding or an intestate proceeding? So what, what element or what particular fact? Okay? The answer is it depends on the gross value of the estate. So meaning how, uh, how, much, uh, the, how much is the worth or the value of the properties of the decedent that he left at the time of his death. Gross means uh, no no deductions yet. Okay, the the liabilities have not been deducted yet. So if it exceeds two million, it belongs it, it belongs to the jurisdiction of the RTC. If it does not exceed two million, two million and below, it belongs to MTC. So this is according to the latest amendment to BP one two nine, which is Republic Act one one five seven six. Question, what is the venue? So now if you determine, for example, that you have left, uh, the, the, the decedent left 10 million pesos. So you cannot say that it belongs to an RTC. Okay, you must file uh, with an RTC. But the question is, where? What RTC uh, will serve as a venue of, of the, let's say, because your Lolo left a will, okay? So what, what will be the venue? What RTC should handle the hearing for the testate proceedings or the probate of the will of your Lolo? So the, the answer is found in rule in the rules 73 section 1. If your Lolo is a resident of the Philippines, then the general rule is that the RTC of the province where the decedent had his last residence. So if your Lolo uh, resided okay, in, let's say, in Negros Occidental before he died or when he died. So the RTC of the province of Negros Occidental shall be the venue okay, of, the, uh, of the estate or the probate. Okay? And the jurisdiction will be will that of uh, RTC. If the estate is below, is 2 million and below, then it will be the MTC of Negros Occidental, okay? But there's an exception. If your Lolo is not a resident of the Philippines, it will be the RTC or MTC of any province where, where he had a state. So let's say he has a land in Negros and a land in Cebu and a condo in Manila. So any of these three provinces or regions shall or Metro Manila shall uh, be the venue can be the venue of the probate of your lolo okay so when you say residence what does it mean residence means actual abode okay the place of abode actual residence of the decedent okay uh, it provided that uh, the decedent uh, stayed there with continuity and consistency okay it doesn't just have that na, uh, if he was only buried there or let's say he his, he resided in Cebu, but he was buried in in Leyte. So Leyte is not the residence, okay? Or maybe he grew up in Cebu, but last residence is in Leyte. So it should be Leyte rather than uh, his uh, previous residence. So it must be proven. So how proven? 
one of the one of the uh, proofs is the uh, uh, death certificate okay but in in one case death certificate is not absolute if it is proven by other documents such as uh, the execution of of uh, of uh, memorandums of or contracts and also where, where he and uh, and his wife live so it was proven that even though the death certificate says that he resided in province a but his wife is in province b and then they executed agreements contracts in province b then what should be followed as a venue would be province b okay it is not also legal residence or domicile so again going back to civil law or political law, domicile residence has uh, differences. Okay, they, they have distinctions. Okay, when is the venue improperly laid? Okay, and what is the remedy in case it's improperly laid? So the answer is it is not improperly laid if the defendant does not object. So again, only until the defendant objects to the venue in a motion to dismiss. In other words. Um, if the defendant does not uh, raise an objection and does not file a motion to dismiss, then the venue is properly laid because the reason for this is that uh, venue is merely, uh, it's merely procedural, okay? And that also the trial court cannot preempt motu proprio this, the dismissal of the case if it, is not an, uh, if it is not a proper venue, okay? When the defendant files a motion to dismiss, the pending case should be dismissed, of course. And then the corresponding proceedings may then, so the remedy is, it may be initiated in the proper court of the proper venue through an ordinary appeal, okay? The, the petitioner must appeal, must appeal from the original dismissed one to the proper court, not through certiorari or prohibition. Except also, not just uh, if you want to avoid the ordinary appeal, you can have it if there's a want of jurisdiction that clearly appears on record. Okay, So, uh, let's say someone filed it in a wrong venue. So, if it clearly appears there, then it must, it can, you, you can file for the uh, petition that it's improperly laid. Okay. So, can venue be waived? Okay. Okay, again, if the defendant does not raise it in a motion to dismiss, it will be deemed waived because it, it is a procedural defect. It is a waivable procedural defect. If a party has been served notice of the filing of probate for a year and allowed the proceedings to continue for a substantial time before filing a motion to dismiss, the case will no longer be dismissed. So this is like the it, it has the it espouses the principle of estopel. Okay. When the party, when the defendant um, allowed the proceedings to go on, okay, without raising that uh, objection that it is a wrong venue, then uh, later on he can he can he can no longer raise that up in the uh, next uh, hearings, okay. What if separate proceedings were filed in the same court? The answer is very simple: they should be consolidated. So can other courts dispose of properties once a court has taken cognizance of the settlement of the estate? In other words, if someone filed it in, let's say, in Cebu, then another one, the, the other uh, heirs filed in Manila. So can Manila hear the same case, the, the same settlement? The answer is no, because the law says the court taking cognizance of the settlement of the estate shall exercise jurisdiction to the exclusion of all other courts. So the keyword here is to the exclusion of all other courts. In other words, the first court that, that recognizes or that received the petition must have the exclusive jurisdiction of such proceedings. No other courts must dispose the properties without the original court's approval. Okay. However, there's an, uh, what if one court is an interstate court and the other one, the other heir filed for a test state proceeding. Okay. So in one case, Cuenco versus CA, uh, it was held by the Supreme Court 
that the first court who took cognizance of of the of the petition for interstate proceedings can or may okay may hold it in abeyance okay in other words it may decline to take cognizance okay of that petition because it has knowledge or it received um, information that test state proceedings has been filed also for the decedent of that uh, for the estate of the same decedent in manila so test state proceedings takes preference over interstate proceedings okay again because going back to succession the law prefers testacy over intestacy so uh the interstate court may may pause or or may uh, hold it in abeyance or may decline to take cognizance and wait for the test state court to prove the will okay and if the test state court will prove that the will was valid so the interstate proceedings will can now be again going back to the previous slide will now be consolidated to the test state proceedings from Cebu to Manila okay what is the nature of estate proceedings? They are proceedings in REM. In other words, in REM means uh, in uh, the thing. No, So it is binding against the whole world. It is proceeding against the thing. So if it's a thing, uh, the actions and decisions will now bind the whole world. Okay, Not just bind persons, but the whole world itself. Meaning all persons that are having interest in the properties or estate of the decedent, whether they were notified or not, or known or not known to the parties, they are equally bound by the proceedings in REM. Okay, and what are the requirements for extrajudicial settlement of estates? So the requirements is or are: first, there must be no will. Okay, the decedent died in testate, then no debts, or if there are debts, they are all paid. The heirs are of age, or if they are not of age, they are properly represented. And then the settlement is made in a public instrument. Okay, <clears throat> So the extrajudicial settlement, for example, that we agree that A will receive this portion, B will receive this portion, C will receive this portion, so it must be notarized. Okay, But again, this notarization is, only for, is not for validity, but for evidentiary purposes. But if there's one heir, no need for public instrument, only by means of an affidavit, okay? And it must be filed with a ROD or Register of Deeds. So after that, the extrajudicial settlement must be publicized in a newspaper in the province where the estate is situated once a week for three weeks. And then there must be filing of a bond. The, the purpose for the bond is of course a protection so that if there is a creditor or someone who has interest in the estate and the the persons executing the extrajudicial settlement their bond will be used to satisfy any claims that they have missed or they may have not included so what if there is a failure to file the EJS or the uh, affidavit of self adjudication it will not affect its validity when there are no creditors prejudiced or when no creditors are involved. Okay? If a person had no knowledge or had not participated in the extrajudicial settlement, is he bound by the constructive notice of publication? So going back again, the essay proceedings are proceedings in REM, right? They bind the whole world, whether they are notified or not. However, what if the extrajudicial, let's say, uh, the heirs, okay, no debt, okay, there's no no debt, and then there's no will, and then the heirs by themselves settle the properties among themselves, okay, without without the court's intervention, okay. But what if there's one heir that they did not notify, okay, there's one creditor, or I mean, there's no creditor, right, because there's no debt, but if there's one heir, okay, that, that is uh, living outside the province, and he did not know that they have already partitioned, uh, divided the estate among themselves. So what will happen? Will, will he be deprived of his share of the estate? The answer is 
No. Rule 74, Section 1, persons who did not participate in the extrajudicial settlement or had no notice of the extrajudicial settlement will not be bound thereby. Again, this is a, for the principle of justice. What about the publication? Isn't it an, a constructive notice? No, because the publication only publicizes after the extrajudicial settlement has been made. It is not a publication of the of the intention to divide the property among themselves. So in other words, you only publicized it just because you already finished doing the division among yourselves. So in other words, the person who did not participate or was not notified, he will not be bound by your uh, uh, divisions or extrajudicial settlement. So what will happen now? Of course, he will be entitled to his own share. Uh, these people, these heirs who allegedly, okay, selfishly uh, acquired the property for themselves will now be liable to, to give their share to this person deprived okay, of this um, inheritance. So is allowance of a will necessary? If there's a will, okay, <laughs> there's a probate. In other words, it must be proved and allowed in a proper court. If it's not proved, if it's, if it's not allowed, if it's not probated, Rule 75, Section 1 says, it will not pass any real or personal property. So again, oh, it's okay if there's no will, okay? It can be the, the heirs can settle, okay? The heirs can now settle it among themselves. They can decide who will get the biggest part and who will get the smallest part or equal sharing, okay? That's okay. But if there's a will, it is necessary that it must be proven by a probate court. Until admitted to probate, it has no force and effect, and no one can claim a right therein. What is a probate court, and what is a special? What is the special jurisdiction of it? What is its role? Okay, the probate court. Its primary concern or jurisdiction is the settlement of the estate of the deceased person. When we say settlement, it involves the administration, the liquidation. Okay, of the property. Its concern is the authentication and the validity of the will that concerns only the capacity of the testator, the compliance with the solemnities that the law requires for wills to be valid, the authenticity of the signature of the testator, and it does not touch upon the validity of the provisions. In other words, its concern is the extrinsic validity of the will, whether it complies with the formalities of the law. So let's say if it's a notarial will, is it properly subscribed or signed by the parties or the witnesses? Is it proper? The, are the pages properly signed? If it's a uh, holographic will, is it written entirely by the hand of the testator? Is it dated? Okay. Is it signed? Is it not uh, typewritten? Okay. Um, is it uh, is it uh, burned? No. Or uh, is it? Uh, if it's a uh, notarial will, is it uh, uh, notarized, okay, properly notarized? And uh, are the witnesses, the required witnesses, complied with? It includes also determining the heirs, appointing administrator, liquidation of assets and liabilities. In other words, it will sum up all the assets of the, of the decedent. It will also uh, collect who are his debtors and satisfy them. It will approve the sale of properties by his prospective heirs before final adjudication. So the court will now, the probate court will now approve that the heir will, will sell this property. Uh, so it will satisfy the debt of the, the decedent. It will not execute, uh, it will not release a writ of execution because as, well, as one case has uh, ruled, uh, oh, the probate court will only approve the sale, not uh, execute a writ of execution. Recognition of a natural child, that's a, that's a jurisdiction of the probate court and allowing and determining if he or she is entitled as an, an illegitimate child or entitled to the legitim, okay? Status of a woman claiming to be the legal wife, legality of the disinheritance of an heir with the testator, pass upon the validity of a waiver of inheritance, and inc incidental matters such as status of each heir, whether the property in inventory is conjugal, or exclusive property of the deceased spouse, and the residue, after all the liabilities have been satisfied, the residue will now be distributed to the lawful heirs. 
what is not included here is the in, the intrinsic validity. In other words, the legality of the provisions of the will. So that involves title and possession to property. That should be threshed out in an ordinary proceeding or in an ordinary action. Okay, that's a general rule. So the probate court acts as a trustee. So that is his role. It is a trustee that must jealously guard the estate and see to it that it is economically and wisely administered and not wasted, according to Tim Ball versus Cano. So that's that's the role and jurisdiction of the probate court. Question, what if during the probate proceedings there a, there's a question of title or possession that whether or not this land is owned by decedent? A, okay. May a probate court pass? The general rule is no, because a probate court is only concerned and only has the authority to prove upon the validity or extrinsic validity of a will, not on the title or possession or the legality of the ownership of the decedent to that pro property. But as questions related to legal ownership, it must be threshed out to a to a separate ordinary civil action. And again, going back to the definition. Ordinary civil actions are adversarial in nature. It's when part one party sues another for the enforcement of a right. So, so the the probate court will now say, "Oh, you're you're fighting. You are suing. You are like you are like having an adversary." Okay, so you fight it over in an in a civil action. Okay, you 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 put it there. You file another case for that because that's not my jurisdiction. Okay. However, there's an exception to that. A probate court may decide or may pass upon the question of uh, title or ownership of a property, but it is only provisional in nature. It is still subject to a final decision of a separate action instituted by the party. So, for example, the court will say, okay, uh, the decedent owns this land in uh Bacolod or in Cebu okay but as as the probate court allows the validity of the or the the probate of that will okay where the where the decedent uh, now disposes that land for example in Bacolod the the parties can now if they argue that no the decedent no longer owns that or it's now sold to blah 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 so now the that will be subject to a separate action, but that probate court's ruling or order will just be provisional, okay? And whatever the decision in the ordinary civil action will now be a pass or will now be uh, retroactively applied to the decision of the probate court. All parties have given their consent, if, if all parties have given their consent, so that the probate court may pass upon the issue of title or Possession. This means that there is no adversarial nature. So all parties now agree, okay, that you know, okay, uh, probate court, let we will let you we will let you decide the title ship, the, the title or possession of this land. So if, if these um, heirs allow it, then the court can decide or pass upon it. The reason for for this limitation again is that. The probate court is a court of limited and special jurisdiction. What is the effect of the probate of the will? It is conclusive as to the due execution of the will. Okay. Summarize three areas of concern in a settlement proceeding. So what are the three areas that the probate court would have to address? It is administration. Again, administration is the management, though, making sure that the property is wisely and uh, economically administered or distributed, not wasted. Okay. Again, this goes back to, to the principle of stewardship. Okay. We don't want to disrespect the, the person who died by squandering his properties and, you know, like the prodigal son, you know, who, who just allowed. So the court will now act as the good son, like. The, the, the son who wanted to, to preserve the hard work of the father. So something like that. Administration. Second is liquidation. Liquidation means uh, determining the assets and the, the debts. 
this one is more uh, it's more concern of the 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 plight of the creditors so you you'll not just protect the estate but you also have to protect the interest of those people who lent their money okay to the dissident so how about them so liquidation will answer that so if the claims are legit okay so here's here's the payment distribution it's more concerned about the heirs it's more concerned about the people who you know in a sense they did not do anything they just receive it gratis gratuitously it's a form of a gratuitous um uh gift okay from the dissident okay who may petition the probate of a will okay h or e d l the executor the device or legacy named in a will again devices are those uh, uh, who have been subject to a gift of real property legacy are the subject of a uh, personal property that have been uh, a subject of a will okay executor named in a will as well to uh, to fulfill the wishes so this edl but also we will add one letter i any interested person so edli interested person who is this okay these are persons who will be benefited or persons who have a claim so either heirs or it can be again types of heirs interstate heirs or legal heirs or compulsory heirs and testate heirs or those who have been named in the will such as legacy device okay next of kin also this means compulsory heirs those with a relationship to the decedent that entitles them to a vested right or a share in the latter's estate as distributees. So, for example, a natural child or a legitimate child. Okay. Is probate of a will subject to prescription? Let's say uh, <clears throat> the decedent died and everybody thought he died intestate without a will. So there's interstate proceedings. So now it was distributed according to the law. And let's say 30 years after a will was a will was discovered, can the persons who received the, the shares through interstate proceedings argue that the will is prescribed? The answer is no, because it is required by public policy that the statute of limitations or prescriptions does not apply to the probate of a will it may be filed at any time last how about if a will was lost or destroyed can it still be probated or proved yes provided the following requirements are met number one it must be proved first that there is execution or due execution and validity that means that uh, it was validly executed by the executor in, in his sound mind and it was executed according to the uh, formalities of the law. Okay, If it's a notarial will or if it's a, a, a holographic will, okay? it's ex executed according to the, the uh, provisions of the law. And it must be proven that it exists at the time of the death of the testator okay? or it was fraudulently or accidentally destroyed during the lifetime of the testator, but without his knowledge. Okay. Number three, provisions are distinctly proved by at least two credible witnesses. And number four, filed and recorded as other wills. So how can we, how can this be done? Let's say there's a photocopy. Okay, a photocopy of that will. So number three will be satisfied that provisions will be proved by at least two credible witnesses. So now, those witnesses who signed the notarial will, for example, will now say, or oh, here's a photocopy, and we certify, we witness, that this is actually what the original will has stated. And we we uh, certify that we prove that uh, when the testator died, this uh, still existed. The original copy existed, but... Uh, after some time, it disappeared. Maybe someone stole it or someone destroyed it or burned it. So those are the what will happen in the proceedings. Okay, Rule 76, Section 6. So 
So that's it. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day.